Alrighty guys, now here we are. Uh, before I actually get into the features of anomaly detection, I wanna quickly go over the problem that anomaly detection is solving for. So let's take a look at this hypothetical example here. Say we have a metric that tracks orders per minute. Say we're some kind of shopping website or shopping business. And we can see that we have a pretty cyclical daily pattern. We have this increase at around midday and then um, it kind of peaks at 6 p.m. or so and then starts dropping off towards midnight and then the cycle just repeats itself for every single day. Now, if I was trying to maintain a business based on this metric where the success of my business is directly dependent on the amount of orders I receive, obviously I want to ensure that this number doesn't have any unexpected drops. So say for instance, right here at prime time, if this number drops to around this value, we can see that's very atypical. That's very out of the normal band of accepted values, right? So clearly that's something I want to be able to detect. And if I do detect it, I need to have my engineers jump on it right away to figure out if there's some kind of dependency failure that's occurring that's causing this drop to occur. Now let's do a quick thought experiment of how we can set up an alarm that gets triggered when our data points drop below some known threshold. So say for instance, at this point here, this is the peak of the day. It's almost maybe 6,000 or so if we're looking at the Y axis here. Now, if something drops below, you know, down here but to below 3,000, at this point in time during the day, obviously this is a huge problem, right? So I can do something pretty naive here. Maybe I could set an alarm for this value, but obviously this doesn't really work at this point of the day when our traffic is just by definition lower than this arbitrary threshold that we just set right over here, right? So setting this kind of static alarm doesn't really work based on our dynamically changing access pattern or dynamically changing orders per minute in this case. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the word low or what is lower than expected is relative to the time of day that you're observing. And this is a problem that anomaly detection is trying to solve. So all that was kind of leading up to one major point, and that's that alarms are often difficult to get right and highly use case dependent. So like we saw, we can't just set some arbitrary static value here because it isn't reflective of our traffic pattern. And the second big problem that anomaly detection is trying to solve is that often alarms can get outdated as access patterns evolve. So in this case, since we're tracking orders per minute, assume for a moment that maybe your business uh, exponentially grows and you're doing double the amount of orders per minute next month as you are this month, then obviously the, all the alarms that you created in the previous steps would quickly become out of date and you need to come back here to change all of your alarms one by one. So what's the answer to these two major problems? Well, the answer is actually Amazon's brand new feature called CloudWatch Anomaly Detection. And this feature turns your boring old metric with some pretty poorly designed hard-coded alarm that looks like this into something much more dynamic that looks like this diagram down here. So what we're seeing here is CloudWatch anomaly detection determining a confidence band of acceptable values that shift over time. And that's indicated by the gray bounds that we're seeing here. The lower gray bound is the lower threshold so it's not expecting to see any values below that. And if we look at the top here, this is the upper threshold. So if values were to exceed this value, that's kind of out of the norm or out of what the expected range. And clearly we can see just by taking a look at this at first glance is that the problem that we were trying to solve earlier with respect to setting an alarm that triggers when our traffic drops below some value becomes a much easier question to answer because our alarm thresholds are changing dynamically based on our access patterns. Now the basic gist of it is, is that this gray area represents our range of acceptable values. So if a value drops below this range, then our alarm gets triggered. And if a value goes above this gray range, then an alarm gets triggered. And this is the gist of how anomaly detection works. So a little bit more detail on how it works. So the way to set it up is that you enable anomaly detection on a metric through the CloudWatch dashboard. You can do this on any metric that exists in the CloudWatch dashboard. And all you have to do is go to the metric section and click on this little icon here. 
And after you click this button, CloudWatch will add the confidence bands to your graph that you can preview. And this happens super quick, at least for me, it only took a second or so. So I literally clicked and the thing popped up almost right away. So I'm fairly certain they're generating this predictive data in advance of clicking these buttons. But anyways, uh, the data these confidence bands are generated is based on a machine learning best fit model that analyzes your historic data for this specific metric that you selected. Now, after you spend five minutes or so admiring this beautiful graph, uh, you can click the alarm bell that's located here and what this do will bring up the third option that allows you to configure and tune the parameters of your anomaly detection alarm and that is over here so just going through this really quickly so firstly you need to specify the metric name in this case i'm looking at order rates um, if you're using dynamo or something like that uh, you need to specify the table name, uh, the statistic that you're generating the metric on. So this can be sum, average, P90, P99, min, max, whatever you want. Uh, the period that you're going to assess the metric on. So if you want something a little more granular, obviously check something like one minute. If your metric is a little bit more coarse, then maybe you want to use something like 15 minutes. And the interesting part here is under the condition section. So previously we only had this static option and I don't think there was even an option before. Um, you couldn't even select anything. And since we have a new option now, now you need to pick between the two. So the static one is the legacy that we're all used to. You set a value and you alarm when you either go below or go above that value. Since this is new, we have an anomaly detection here as a potential option. And there's three key options that you can pick when you're creating this alarm. So you can pick outside of the band. So in this case, if we are above the band, so anywhere from here up, or if we are below the band, so anywhere from here down, then we alarm. That's what this option means. And then we have a second option here called greater than the band. And that means we're only looking at cases where our metric instance rises above this band, this gray band here. And then conversely, we also have a metric for lower than the band. So only alarm when our value drops below this expected value here on the bottom end. And then we have an option here to specify the standard deviation of the band. So say for instance, we wanted a much wider band that maybe the, the lower range was down here and the upper range was up here. We could increase this value to three and say conversely, if we wanted a much tighter band, so maybe something that looked a little bit like this, we can drop this number down to maybe one or so to get a range that is much tighter. So this is the basic gist of how anomaly detection works. Basically, you find a metric, you click this button, it shows you a preview, you tune your model, and you're pretty much good to go. Now, in terms of cost, there's a couple of key things that you should probably be aware of. So the cost structure for this feature is fairly straightforward. Uh, for an out-of-band alarm, that's going to cost you 30 cents per alarm per month. And if you recall in the previous part of this video, I mentioned that there were three options when you're creating your alarm. There's the within band, which corresponds to your alarm getting triggered when you're above this band or below the band. There's also the above threshold, which is only when you're above this threshold. And conversely, only when you're below the threshold. Uh, so those are three separate types of alarms. Based on the documentation, it seems like the cost is the same for each alarm type. Uh, so just keep that in mind when you're setting your alarms. Uh, so as an example, 10 out-of-band alarms would end up costing you $3 per month, which I think you can agree is a pretty reasonable cost based on the quality of the product that you're getting. Um, in terms of availability, the preview is available in all regions except for Hong Kong, China, and GovCloud. And one thing that I just wanted to add is that these prices are for US East 1. Uh, if you are operating outside of this region, I highly suggest you check out the CloudWatch pricing on the AWS website just to ensure that the price is consistent with what I'm showing here. In terms of best practices, there's actually four that I really wanted to go over. Obviously for the first one, the more data, the better prediction that you're gonna get. And this almost goes without saying. So the ML model won't be able to give you reliable and predictable confidence bands if it doesn't have an adequate amount of data to analyze your metric. So make sure if you're using this feature, you should have enough historic data for the machine model to work effectively. Uh, the model by default will train on two weeks worth of historic data. So I would say you should aim to at least have two weeks or more of data when creating your CloudWatch anomaly detection alarms. Uh, secondly, anomaly detection cannot predict black swan events. So something like in our example, Boxing Day shopping, where we would experience a sudden burst of traffic over a very short period. So be prepared of getting some false positive alarms during these times. 
The third main point is that if you do have these black swan events in your data set, you should definitely exclude them from training your model. If you don't, your model will base itself on these black swan events and won't give you a predictable confidence band that is truly reflective of your day-to-day -day access patterns. And finally, if it isn't already clear, uh, this feature is mostly ideal for those of you that have a very predictable trend, uh, either regular cycles like the smooth curve that we were seeing before, or even flat metrics, or sloped upward or downward metrics. These are the scenarios where this feature really shines and does well. Uh, if you try to jam anomaly detection into just some random metric that doesn't have any predictable pattern, the ML model will be ineffective at predicting any kind of trend. I think this is actually a very interesting new feature that they're coming out with. And I think this is a gateway of many new features that we're going to be seeing in the future. And the first of those features is possibly predictive Dynamo to be auto scaling. Uh, so auto scaling in its current form doesn't have any kind of prediction based on it. It's very reactive. I can truly see this being as a new feature that comes out in response to this new anomaly detection offering that makes your auto scaling that much more effective. So hopefully they come out with something interesting like that soon. A second example that came to me was maybe something like predictive lambda concurrency that minimizes your cold start problem. Uh, if you aren't familiar with cold start, cold start just basically means that if you get a sudden burst of requests on your Lambda, the Lambda service will need to spin up new instances so that it can serve traffic for your Lambda. Now, if we're using anomaly detection and we can anticipate that your traffic will increase at certain points of the day, obviously Lambda can be more proactive in provisioning those resources to serve your traffic. Now, I'd love to hear what you think. If you can leave me a comment down in the comment section below of where you see this new feature going and what spinoffs you think AWS is going to come out with as a result of it. If you're interested in learning more about this feature, I'm going to be leaving a link below to an awesome AWS blog post about anomaly detection. So make sure to check that out. So thanks so much for watching, guys. As always, if you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them down below. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.